when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's the opening to the Declaration of Independence. Hey guys, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Uh, and today I'm coming to you with the first in a new history series on the American Revolution. We've been waiting on this a long time, haven't we? We've been waiting for me to wax poetic for 25 minutes straight about the Founding Fathers, and I'm sure I won't let you down today. Uh, so I chose the American Revolution, particularly for the summer, because Independence Day is in a couple of weeks. And the American Revolution is my absolute favorite historical time period. Sometimes it switches up with the Wars of the Roses and the Viking Age in Britain, but it's always in the top three for me. And particularly when I'm talking about it, it is certainly my favorite. And we're entering into the 250th anniversary of many of the events that sparked the revolution. We're currently within that because some things happened in 1765, so in 2015, we started entering into the realm of 250th anniversaries for certain events. Next year will be the 250th anniversary of the Boston Massacre. So we're entering into a time when a lot of these events are going to be making news, I presume. Uh, new books will be released on all of these. Uh, I'm hoping, I'm really hoping that scholarship on the American Revolution really takes off. Because in many ways, to be a period that is of especially huge import here in the States. Uh, even here in America, we don't pay it much mind. Uh, and for me personally, I remember in my AP US history class, which was the defining course of history that you had to take in high school, we started with the early Republic. We started in 1789 when Washington entered the presidency. We did not even cover the American Revolution. And I find that to be a crying shame. Uh, and so everything that I know and I've learned about the American Revolution over the years has come from my own personal study. Uh, so maybe you're like me and that was a gap in your schooling. Uh, maybe you are from Europe or Australia or somewhere like that. And this is just something that's not taught in schools to you at all because it didn't really affect you. Um, because as I understand it, it's not taught at all in England, like to England, who was of course who we fought. Uh, it is not taught there. It is not viewed as anything near as destructive as we here in the States think it was. We think of it as the beginning of the end of the British Empire, which is so not the case, so not true at all. Uh, but I find it particularly odd that I never learned about it in school to a very detailed degree because I am from one of the original 13 colonies. I am from North Carolina. I'm sure you can tell by the way I talk. And my hometown was the location of one of the final battles in the American Revolution. Uh, so I may be closer to it than most, but I think that makes it even more egregious that there was no real focus on it, especially when we were in high school. But to tell you a little bit about the American Revolution, if you don't know anything about it, uh, there were 13 original colonies. They're here on the Eastern seaboard. But this period of time takes place from 1775 to 1783. That is the period of battles. Uh, the opening battles and opening engagements of the American Revolution happened in April 1775 at the Battles of Lexington and Concord in Massachusetts uh, and ended with the Battle of Yorktown in 1781. But the signing of the Treaty of Paris did not take place until 1783. But that's a very loose definition of the time period. I have seen some people set it from 1765 to 1789 with the swearing in of George Washington. I typically like to include the earlier period, but I do it from about 1770 to 1783. Uh, I do not include the early years of the Republic when we're trying to figure out how to govern ourselves, how to become a new country. Uh, I don't include that because the war is done. And I think you can make an argument that many of the events leading up to the war were certainly kind of engagements in it. I think the Boston Tea Party, yeah. Of the Boston Massacre, yeah. I think several of those events that were happening in New England, you can make arguments for saying that they were within the American Revolution. And throughout the war, the war moves south 
Uh, so the beginning engagements, everything happening at the very start of the war, 1775, 1776, midway through 76. Uh, that's happening in New England, specifically in Massachusetts, uh, particularly in Boston, which the British held until 1776 when George Washington kind of drove them out. Uh, and then they moved down to the middle colonies, New York in 1776, New Jersey, and then into Pennsylvania. Those are the most famous engagements of the American Revolution, happened from 1776 to around 1778. Uh, this is, we're talking about Trenton, we're talking about the winter at Valley Forge. And then we move down south, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia with the blockades at Charleston and Savannah. Uh, and of course, the big battle in my hometown. But I'm going to divide this series into two parts. I'm just going to call it the Founding Fathers and the Forgotten Founding Fathers. Uh, and the reason for this is there are a lot of lists out there that kind of try to be the official list of the Founding Fathers. And a lot of this started with uh, Richard B. Morris, who was a historian in the 1970s, and he gave what he said was the ultimate list of seven Founding Fathers. His list was Jefferson, Washington, Adams, Hamilton, John Jay, Ben Franklin, and James Madison. So those are his seven, and a lot of people take that as gospel. They take that as true fact. There are only seven founding fathers. That's them. Uh, but sometimes you'll see a list of around 10. Uh, they are typically the first five presidents. So Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe. Uh, and then you have the men who were never president, but who played an incredibly large role in the founding of the country, either during the war or immediately post-war. So you have John Jay, who is a name that is all but forgotten nowadays, uh, which is a crying shame. The man was a genius, but he was instrumental in writing some of the founding documents and procuring the Treaty of Paris to end the war in 1783. Then you have Alexander Hamilton, your resident genius. Your other resident genius, Ben Franklin, uh, and occasionally you will see John Hancock and Sam Adams. Uh, John Hancock was more heavily involved at the beginning of the war, as was Sam Adams. And most people nowadays can tell you one thing about John Hancock and one thing alone, uh, and that his, that his signature is the big, beautiful, bold signature on the Declaration of Independence. Uh, and if you go to see the Declaration in Washington at the National Archives, it's sad, really. Uh, it has seen some degradation over the years, but John Hancock's signature is the only one you can make out. Uh, and he signed it big, famously, because he wanted George the third to be able to read it. But uh, John Hancock did more than sign the Declaration of Independence. Sam Adams not being included on these lists personally really miffs me. Uh, I don't think that the United States would be here today without what Sam Adams did. And Sam Adams now, most people only know him as a brewer, which he actually never was. Uh, he had family who was involved in breweries, uh, and to a certain extent, he was, but this was not his job in any way, shape, or form. The Samuel Adams Brewery in Boston is not his brainchild, believe it or not. It is not his brainchild, but that's the only thing people can tell you about Sam Adams today. As a person, probably wouldn't get on with him. Uh, he's a rabble rouser. He likes to cause trouble. In some circles, he's viewed as a crook. Uh, and I agree with all of those sentiments. I would never want to meet the man. I would never want to be friends with him. I couldn't be friends with him. But without him, we have none of this. You can make the argument that it would have happened one day anyway, that somebody in another colony or some of the other Sons of Liberty there in Boston would have made the decisions and the choices that Sam Adams did. But I personally think this is like a butterfly effect question. You know, you step on a butterfly and you change everything. I think if you take Sam Adams out of the equation, we get nothing. Uh, certainly we don't get the battles of Lexington and Concord, which were the opening engagements in the war. And we have no proof that anybody else would have fired off a shot if they hadn't been there that day. Uh, and so for me, I have what you might term a very loose definition of founder. If you did anything for the war effort, if you fought in the war, you are a founder. You're a founding mother, you're a founding father. Basically, if you lived at the time, guess what? You're a founder. I consider General Cornwallis a founding father. Now, yeah, that's crazy, but I do. So in my Founding Fathers series, I will cover the names you know. I'll cover George Washington. I'll cover John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, 
Uh, they are all incredibly instrumental. I would never argue otherwise. They are incredibly instrumental and I love them all. Uh, but they get a lot of focus. In my Forgotten Founding Fathers series, I will hopefully cover some more names and a lot of them will be names that you know uh, and that you might be shocked to find out are actually not considered to be founding fathers. Men like Paul Revere, not considered to be a founding father. Uh, men like Nathaniel Green, who commanded the Continental Army down here in the South. Men like Benedict Arnold. Yeah, sorry, he counts. He counts. Don't argue with me. There are a lot of figures in the American Revolution that have been forgotten over the years that were remembered really well in the immediate 50 years post-war. Uh, they were incredibly famous. They were talked about as folk heroes. They were th people that you learned about in school. And yet for some odd reason, over the past 200 years, uh, we've forgotten a lot of their names. Men like Joseph Warren, men like Benjamin Talmadge, men like Nathan Hale. Unfortunately, a lot of these figures are now so obscure that there has been no recent scholarship on them. Uh, so I find that to be kind of sad. So I'll never be able to cover them in a great deal of depth. Uh, and the same goes for the British side of the war. I love a lot of the Brits that are on the English side, but we're pretty firmly uh, in the camp of colonial here in America. And so a lot of those men have not received recent scholarship or recent biographies here. Um, in over a hundred years if they ever got them to begin with. And I think that's even the case in England. A lot of these men did not go on to become much of anything big post-war, except for maybe General Cornwallis. But after talking about that for 20 minutes and introducing you to it, today I just thought that I would do an intro to the American Revolution, the things that are not going into specific details about specific people. So no biographies today. So first of all, I wanted to recommend you some primary sources. Uh, and this is an absolute boon. This is a number one reason why I think that the American Revolution is a period that you should study. Uh, the American Revolution is on par with several other time periods in history that I think are absolutely fantastic. You have the period just a few years afterwards that is the French Revolution. Then you have uh, Rome, in the first century BC with Caesar and Cleopatra, Antony. I think the same case can be made for Renaissance Italy, uh, where literally everyone is worth learning about and worth getting their own biography. Uh, it's crazy. And the American Revolution is one of those time periods. It is just full of amazing, amazing historical figures. But nearly everyone who is a big name in the American Revolution kept their own records was a writer or a speaker, an orator, and so someone who wrote speeches. And so what you have is a great deal of people who either wrote their own speeches and saved them, recorded what was going on during the war as it was happening, or people who observed the war and observed the speeches and wrote them down for you. Uh, so you have such an incredible amount of primary source detail and documentation here. So for each person that I talk about, I'll probably have some writing of theirs uh, to recommend to you, or at least a speech. But today, to get started, I would like to recommend that you read Common Sense by Tom Paine. Now, if you have never read this, uh, it was an incendiary pamphlet that was published in 1776, arguing for the colonies to get independence from Britain. It is incredibly difficult for me to exaggerate the importance of common sense in the early war effort. Common sense was genuinely a revolutionary, pun intended, it was a revolutionary pamphlet. And it was something that literally everyone and their brother read. They read to each other, they were reading it at taverns. It was something that just lit a fire under everyone in the colonies. And I also definitely have to recommend to you to read the Declaration of Independence. It's short. You can read it online in 10 minutes. Uh, this is, like I said, a period that is very unique. Uh, to be 250 years ago, which I know is a short time to the majority of the rest of the world, but to be 250 years ago, it is so well documented. We can read the things that the people who founded our country wrote down. Uh, and if you have a curiosity about American history, where we got our start, the Declaration is wonderful reading. It's inspiring. It's wonderful. Uh, there are contradictions in it. All men created equal, of course, 
Many of our founders were slave owners. Our founders were not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, in recent years, that's come to be understood, but it used to be basically a form of hero worship for all of the founders. Uh, luckily, that is no longer the case. We can take a more nuanced view of them. Uh, their sins do not make them any less worthy of study or any less worthy of admiration, in my opinion. But it is something to take into consideration is that all men are created equal while they forgot about the third of the country that was slaves and they forgot about women. Uh, so this is something that I, like I said, take it with a grain of salt. Uh, but I think it's eye-opening. Next, I will move on to some historical fiction books. Uh, when I've talked about the American Revolution previously, a lot of people have said they've read some nonfiction on it, but they've never dipped their toes into historical fiction. Uh, so I have a few here that I'd like to recommend to you. I've already talked before about Jeff Shara's series, Rise to Rebellion, his duology. Still highly recommend it, 100% read that. Uh, but since I've talked about it before in depth, I will move on to some others that I have here. First, I have John Jakes's series. This starts with The Bastard, uh, and the second is The Rebels. The first two cover the American Revolution period. Uh, and this is a style of historical fiction that I think has sadly died out, which is telling the narrative of a family across multiple generations and basically using the background of American history to get them up to the modern day. Uh, John Jakes, these books I believe were published in the 70s and 80s. I think they're still really good. I think they hold up, but this follows a kid who is um, an illegitimate child of someone in the British gentry. He is forced to leave with his mother and go to the New World. He winds up in Boston and he is present in the first book for all of the beginning stages of the revolution, things getting set up, the Boston Massacre, the Boston Tea Party, uh, the battles at Lexington and Concord, and then the Battle at Bunker Hill is how this book opens. These first two, as far as I know, actually maybe the first three, focus on the American Revolution and then it moves into the Civil War. Uh, so you can at least read these first three and you'll certainly have an idea of what's going on. But John Jakes is one I would recommend. And there are several other series like this that are out there. Uh, but sadly, I think they've gone out of print. So I hesitate to recommend something that you would probably have a hard time getting your hands on, but do some looking around on thrift books. I highly recommend thrift books. Uh, you can find a lot of things that have gone out of publication there and for fairly cheap. Uh, so do some looking around. If you find that you like a generational story like this, like I used to, I think that that would benefit you. You can do some searching and I think you can certainly find some stuff. Then I would recommend Donna Thorland. Uh, this is Mistress Firebrand. Uh, I made the mistake when I first picked up her series, which I think is overall called The Renegades of the American Revolution. They bear no resemblance to each other. None of the same characters cross over. They are each set at different periods of the war in different locations. This one is set 1777 in New York with the British occupation. Uh, and trying to get out of the city. But these are historical romances. Frankly, that is what they are. And when I first picked them up, I thought they were going to be heavier historical fiction. I thought that they were going to be dealing a little bit more with real historical figures of the day. That's not the case. But if you're into historical romance, I think that she's a pretty good writer. And once you know it's historical romance, I feel like you can go into it and really enjoy it for what it is. So Donna Thorland has several books out. This is just one. Last but not least, I would recommend the Patriot Witch series by C.C. Finley. Uh, and this is a series that I actually think has gone out of print. But I know for a fact you can find it on Thrift Books because that's where I found it. Uh, but this is the American Revolution with Magic which is, uh, it's a very niche thing and you may not like it uh, if you're not that open to something that can actually be fairly strange. If you're not that open to historical fantasy and this kind of throws you in, uh, it may not be for you, but if you're someone who likes fantasy and who likes historical fantasy, I think it's very interesting and it's something that's incredibly unique on the market. Like I said, uh, the American Revolution is rarely touched in historical fiction. And now I'll move into some nonfiction. Uh, and so we got to get the big daddy out of the way. You've heard of one book about the American Revolution. One book. I know what it is. 
It's David McCullough's 1776, isn't it? If you've read one book or heard of one book about the American Revolution, it is this. Uh, and I think that's for good reason. I really do. I think David McCullough is an excellent writer uh, and his biography on John Adams is equally as popular as well it should be. It's an incredibly good biography of John Adams. I would hold off on recommending this until I talked a little bit about George Washington. 1776 is certainly George's year, uh, but a lot happened in 1776. Uh, it's looked at as the founding year because, of course, the Declaration of Independence was written and signed in 1776. I think that's generally why people look at 1776 as the number one all-important year in the history of our country. Uh, it is very important, but let me offer you a dissenting opinion. This is 1775 by Kevin Phillips. And Kevin Phillips makes the argument here that 1775 is the year we should be remembering as the foundation of our country over 1776. Uh, we remember 1776 because of the Declaration of Independence, and I'm not going to argue with you on that. It is certainly probably the most important event in the entirety of the war. Even over winning the war, literally writing that document was instrumental. In the war effort. It was instrumental. People read this, heard it read aloud in their towns, and it just changed everything. So I'm not going to argue with that. But I completely agree with Kevin Phillips here that 1775 is overlooked. People forget this. People forget what happened in 1775. Nothing that happened in 1776 could have happened without this year. Uh, this is the year of Lexington and Concord. This is the year of the Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. This is the year of Bunker Hill. You have the two opening battles, opening engagements of the American Revolution that happen here. You have the occupation of Boston by the British, uh, and you have an event that has been mythologized in our history. It is an event that all children know. They grow up hearing about it. It is the Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. All of this happened in 1775. The Declaration would not have happened without this year. So I completely agree with Kevin Phillips here. I will also be recommending this in conjunction with a couple of other figures when we get around to them. So uh, wait for that. But you'll see this book and 1776 probably pretty frequently. An author I would like to recommend is Nathaniel Philbrick. This is his book on Bunker Hill, which was, as I just said, one of the opening engagements in the revolution. He has several books set on this period now. I really like Nathaniel Philbrick. He is another awesome popular historian who has, I think, kind of unintentionally fallen in love with the time period. He has now set at least three books in the American Revolution. You can actually read his three books back to back, and I think you would get a pretty good narrative history of the war in its entirety. Uh, start with Bunker Hill, move on to his book about Benedict Arnold and George Washington, and then finish with the Southern campaigns ending at Yorktown. And I think you would get a fairly good narrative history. Uh, fairly good three-part history of the war. But I just like Nathaniel Philbrick, so I thought I would recommend him. Another author I'd recommend is Joseph J. Ellis. Uh, this is his book, Founding Brothers. This focuses on the period immediately post-war, focuses on certain events happening in the lives of the Big Seven Founding Fathers. Uh, so Hamilton's duel with Burr, Adam's presidency, things like that. Uh, he has several books and biographies on the Founding Fathers. I like Joseph Ellis. He's typically pretty short-winded. Uh, sometimes that can be a detriment to you when you want a little bit more detail, like in this book. But I would suggest if you read this book and you wanted to know a little bit more, then then you can move on to, into like Ron Chernow's big biography of Hamilton. But he has several books set around the Revolutionary Period, and so he's an author that I think is worth your time. Next, I would recommend The Glorious Cause. This was part of the Oxford History of America. Uh, this is a very old book. I think it was published 30 years ago, but uh, it's still extremely good. And David Murphy is hosting a read-along of it this month on his channel. So I'll link to that down below, and you can watch his videos back and see a little bit about what he's discussing over time, uh, but this covers the war in its entirety. It goes from 1763 to 1789, so it's covering a good chunk pre-war and a good chunk post-war, uh, so it gets you up to the presidency of Washington. Uh, I think this is a really good comprehensive history. It's actually pretty short, 
all things considered, uh, this is a very old beat up copy. I really don't know how I wound up with this, but uh, it is well worth your time. It's one that's been talked about pretty frequently over the years, and I think with good reason. Uh, the scholarship is pretty great. Not a whole lot has changed in recent years. The events are still the same, so I do, I highly recommend this. And last but not least, in terms of nonfiction, I would recommend Patriots. Uh, and something that this book does well, this is another older book, but something that this book does really well is it breaks things down into chapters based on individual Patriots during the war. Uh, I think this is a very valuable book. I think it's one that you can keep on hand and read a chapter of and stop, but it also does a fairly good job at trying to give you a narrative history in one book, which is a hard feat for any book to achieve. It is very, very difficult for the American Revolution to be summed up in one book, just like it would be for World War II. Uh, so this I do recommend. I've sat here, I've talked for like an hour. I'm sure for each of these videos, I will do a little bit of this and tell you a little bit about the figure before we get into the book recommendations or the recommendations of their own writing. Uh, so bear with me for that. I do have to talk about these people. Uh, I'm half in love with all of them. Thank you for wanting to learn about this. I think it is one of the greatest periods of human history. It really is. And I say that not only as an American, I say that as a lover of history, as a lover of good writing, uh, just as a lover of people who genuinely can amaze you. There are several of those in the American Revolution, uh, some of which died early. I mean, there are so many figures in the American Revolution who died during the war or who died immediately post-war, like Nathaniel Green. He died immediately post-war in Savannah, like heat stroke. A man like Nathaniel Green could have gone on to have a career in Congress. A man like Joseph Warren, who died at Bunker Hill in 1775, he never even saw the Declaration of Independence signed. He could have become a president. There are so many men like that who died during the Revolution, who afterwards became, you know, members and originators of offices in our government. It is incredible. And so I'm very, very excited about this series. I'm excited to talk about this with you guys. Uh, if you have any recommendations for me, Tell me about them down below. If you've read any of these, let me know. But I will see you next week for another installment in this series. But that's all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.